before we begin, I would like to show you a clip from the movie Saw, released in 2004. Regrettably, the quality was a lot better on my laptop, but I don't know if you got the basic gist of what happened in that scene, or maybe you've seen the movie already. But I'd like to take a moment to ask you, what reactions did you have to seeing that on screen? It made my stomach <laughs> The fascinating thing about the horror genre is that it can elicit both a mental and a physical response. Maybe you feel afraid, maybe you feel nervous, maybe you feel disgusted. There's also the physical, like maybe your muscles tense up, maybe your stomach gets upset, maybe your heart beats really fast. Horror has this way to affect us on this level, which makes it a fascinating, fascinating genre to study. And it may also explain why horror has been a consistently popular genre over the course of time, since probably its inception right after the end of World War I. And it brings up a further question, is why would audiences pay to have this emotional trauma as they are sitting there to watch a movie? When you think about it, it's sort of a psychological masochism to sit there and then take that. My mission statement for my project was to look at both Japanese and American horror cinema and try to understand how cultural trauma and traumatic events find the representations in these movies and then what this then says about each of the respective cultures. For my project, I chose the three disciplines of history, media and cultural studies, and visual arts and film. I obviously centered my study on film itself, but to understand what's happening in the film through the narrative structure and the cinematic techniques, you need to then put that in the context of history and media and cultural studies. By transporting this context into a different discipline, you can then get a better idea of the larger picture at hand. For, for establishing common ground, my primary technique was extension. By extending what I found in the discipline of film, or the disciplines of history, media, cultural studies, into the other discipline to get a larger picture. Which brings me then into the bridging strategy I utilized, which was building complex and multicultural explanations. By, by doing a film analysis, I then bring up questions I can look for in the disciplines of history, media, and cultural studies, which then feeds back into film with my new insight prompting more questions for analysis. My primary sources were the films themselves, along with texts written about these films. Additionally, when dealing with specific events, I would then look for articles pertaining to these events in question. I would now like to present another clip, this one being from Invasion of the Body Snatchers, released in 1956 by Don Siegel. I divided my study into two sections, the first being on the legacy of World War II in both America and Japan. For this specific section, I primarily dealt with Invasion of the Body Snatchers for American film, along with Gojira, or Godzilla, for Japanese. Invasion of the Body Snatchers presents a scenario where the American way of life that the sense of identity is threatened by a hostile alien force which is slowly replicating each of, the each of the citizens of the California town of Santa Mira. This, right after the aftermath of World War II, America was feeling threatened on the global scale. They were presented with a new rival, which was the Soviet Union. 
And so this film represents the sort of rampant paranoia at the time, this fear of complete takeover or annihilation. And so the, my American example primarily deals with foreign policy and a look outwards. Meanwhile, Gojira mainly deals with Japanese problems. It, it's more of a reflect on the trauma and rampant destruction faced during World War II. The way Godzilla is portrayed in the film, appearing at night, leveling entire cities, is very, re very reminiscent of the Tokyo fire bombings, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Even the scenes of wounded people being traded for burns is very similar to footage or the images of survivors of these attacks in real life. So while American films are primarily deal with an outside threat, Japan was looking inwards and trying to heal old wounds. I would now like to present a clip from Takashi Miike's audition, released in 1999. My second section does not deal with a specific event, but it deals with a trend in horror cinema, which is the body horror subgenre, specifically the emergence of torture porn around the new millennium. Classic examples of this are Audition by Takashi Miike and Hostel, which is actually the film which prompted the, term, the development of the term torture porn by critics. Audition doesn't necessarily deal with a specific event, but can be seen as a reflection on gender issues in Japan. Essentially, the film revolves around a romance between a widower and a young woman who seems to represent the ideal traditional Japanese woman which is very subservient and quiet and unassuming. However, through the course of the film, is real she is actually a very dominating predatorial figure. In this way, the film seems to represent the concern that an empowered woman is a threat to an older patriarchal society. And this plays out over the course of the film through this transformation. So with body horror in Japan, the focus seems to be inward once again. But then looking at American film with Hostel and other films such as Saw or other related torture porn films, the focus is instead on foreign policy in America and abroad. Hostel, that Hostel portrays two young Americans who are subjected to brutal punishment solely for being American. However, the more horrifying part of the film is not their torture or torment, is then their transformation into torture themselves. And this seems to represent the concern growing through the war on terror over the justification of violence. How far would you go to prevent a bomb going off? Or what levels would you be willing to stoop to in order to promote peace or safety? And it really seems to capture the fears present in the post 9 in America. In concluding, Although horror films seem to share similar tropes, whether they be in Japan or America, ultimately, these tropes are used for different social concerns and to represent different social events or traumatic events. It's an interesting question to think of how horror will pan out over time, whether in Japan with the recent nuclear Fukushima Daiichi incident, if that may find representation in film, or possibly in America with the issues of NSA surveillance, if those will then become a prominent feature in films to come. And I would like to thank you for your time, and I'll open it for questions. Yes. First, thank you for not showing a clip from the rain, since we'd be scared of the liquid out of our bodies. <laughs> uh, do you think that 
car films in general are a reflection of these sorts of trends, or do you think that there are specific instances that are sort of keystones of, of representation? I don't think it's narrow to a specific film, but I think it's more of looking at trends in these films over time. Like, why is a genre such as well, torture porn popular at a specific point in time? Because immediately after 9-11, although there were comfort films being released, sort of like ease the worries over the attack, I think like Ladder 49 or other such films, picturing like Hell Rutwicks during the 9-11 incident, those actually lost in the box office to a lot of the horror films coming out at that time. So it's interesting to look at a, a scenario like that and then see what emerges as the popular medium. Um, well, nowadays directors have an opportunity to blather on about what they were intending and what they were doing when they wrote the film, um, uh, or produced the film. What do you hear from them when they talk about how they're incorporating these kinds of external events into their films? What are the, what are the, what are the writers and directors saying about what they're doing? Oh, I think it's interesting because sometimes it seems more on a subconscious level, like it's not explicitly stated in their mission statement. Like for instance, Takashi Miike, going back to him as many times as I can, um, he actually said he didn't make audition for any greater social concern, it was just made to gross people out. Yeah, it's garnered a lot of critical study because it presents these issues or seems to strongly allude to them. So I think it's not always the director's intent, but more of what influenced them and what brought them to that point, or which ties in with the culture that surrounds them. I guess you got me now thinking along different lines. So let me try and get back to the question. It struck me when you were talking about the Godzilla versus Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I'm not a film buff, but I'm not aware of much alien based, outer space horror sci fi from Japan, which probably is my ignorance. But is that very much the motif you're referring to as of internal external, that Japan's horror is more nature doing something bad back at us, whereas America has a stronger motif of something truly external? I believe so. If you look at American films at that time, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and, I guess, War of the Worlds, which was yet another movie about like a hostile alien species invading America and trying to destroy everything. But if you look at Japan, it's more self-reflective. He had films like Godzilla, but there was also a very prominent ghost story called Augetsu, which was sort of a slow, melancholy look back on the war and the losses that were shared. So although it's not solely giant monsters, that was certainly the most famous example and the most popular one. But I thought, that maybe I'm mistaken, that the genesis of Godzilla originally was the nuclear attacks during the war, which would seem very external as a cause. Well, I know in the film, Godzilla was actually the result of atomic testing, like offshore in Japan, which was strongly influenced by the Lucky Dragon 5 incident. It was after the war, there was a fishing boat that went out and was caught in US atomic testing. And these fishermen who then came back to the shore, well, they slowly died off from radiation poisoning. That sparked a huge incident in Japan. But there are also a lot of allusions to former things, such as pollution and this sense of corruption, or like what is necessary for war. One of the main characters, uh, the fiance of one of the key protagonists, is a scientist who's developing a weapon, and it's sort of reflecting like the former, what is the cost of success? What is the price you're willing to pay to win? Well, it's interesting that the way they get rid of Godzilla is with the same sort of warlike scientific methods that may have generated in the first It's not necessarily a happy ending. Can I ask you one more? Go ahead, I have one more. Oh, but okay. yeah, we've got time actually. But am I right in thinking you're telling us that really horror then is catharsis? That the, the biggest reason why we watch horror is to confront our fears and process them better? I think, I don't remember the exact quote, but Stephen King went on to say that watching a horror movie is a lot like riding a roller coaster, and there's this feeling of reintegration. You get on the roller coaster, you're scared, you're frightened, but you're safe. And you get off feeling safe and unharmed. It's a lot like that. And prior, well, a good example is prior to 9-11, that was the feeling you went to see in horror movies. 
the bad guy would always, well, he wouldn't win at the end, someone would survive, or maybe he'd get killed off. But after that, there's this overwhelming sense of nihilism. So I don't know if that same catharsis is present anymore. You have films like Hostel, Saw, like The Strangers, where people are just punished for being there. There's no real reason to it. No one wins in the end, and it's just very, there's this loss of hope over time. Except that we still get off the roller coaster on home at the end of it, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What's well, similar to what I was going to ask, I mean, I saw you use Noel Carroll's weird sources and that's philosophy of humor. There's a relief theory where we will laugh at something that we find offensive to sort of get rid of this kind of negative energy. Do you think horror film then is something that's cathartic in this sort of way, or do you think it's more just sort of a, a reflection of what people are feeling at the time and not meant for anything more than this sort of uh, uh, a representation of what this society is going through? It may not specifically be made to be cathartic. I don't think a director who made Attack of the Giant Crab People went into it thinking that he helped heal social wounds. <laughs> but I think at a subconscious level, we go to these films and we see these things happening to other people and we experience the same fear that they feel on screen. You know, when someone shrieks at seeing a monster, we may then feel startled. We're sutured into their emotional response. I think in that way, we then come out of it feeling like we made it, we survived, good for us. And maybe at a subconscious level, the reason why these fears hit home so much is that they have a reflection in specific cultural or social events. Yeah, I suppose a quick one. Um, what, what do you think it says about us today that mindless zombies yes. are the creature of, of the moment? I feel like there's a lot you can get out of that. Maybe the fear of just being one of thousands, being lost in the crowd, just a shambling like thing, lost in a sea of people. Maybe a fear of, I guess, over-media saturation. We're all just being bombarded by things that change who we are, like a virus, or... I feel like zombies, they're apparently the next big thing. They're in video games, they're in movies, they're in comics, they're in TV, they're on kids' toys, they're in advertisements. Well, thank you very much, and we'll flip to our final speaker. We've got a couple of minutes for questions.